Hey, hey, hey gang, what's going on? Up here in the beautiful Northwoods. Little snow. Thought I'd give you an update on the channel. Um, everything's going good. We got the seaplane that the uh, caravan is in for repaint. So not doing much this winter, but this spring we're going to uh, we're going to have some fun. Maybe go to Alaska. Definitely do some cool destinations. Anyway, I got a few emails on uh, hey, what got me into all this stuff. So I thought I'd I thought I'd share that and. Uh, I might as well share a bear story that goes with it because it all happened in Alaska. That's what kind of got me into all this, uh, all this adventure stuff. The final frontier, Alaska, right? So it was back about uh, 25 years ago. I was um, with three buddies. One guy's name was Smiley. He was the big time dentist at Hinsdale, is probably. I think he's retired now. And uh, Billy Hayes, we called him Ninja. He used to be an Army Ranger, weapon specialist, all-around great guy. And a buddy named Bob Bergdahl, he's the guy I met everybody through. And a uh, local businessman. And uh, Smiley had been up to Alaska, I think it was his first time, and he hooked up at this uh, lodge. Um, out on the peninsula and he's like well let's go out there let's go check this place out so i was in bob was in billy was in so we booked a flight got out there flew to anchorage and uh from anchorage we flew to a place called iliama out on the peninsula it's a huge lake a massive lake if you look at kodiak island and the katmai go north of there central right in the middle there's this you can't miss it, a giant lake. Anyway, on the northeast side, east side, there's a town called Iliama. At the time, it was a gravel runway. Like I said, I think it was in the mid-90s. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, it was really cool landed. First thing I see is, uh, first time I've ever seen a Tundra Tire, Stoll Plane, uh, Super Cub, and they were all over the place. We, land, we took off from there. Um, Actually, you know what? It was uh, we got there, we got to Anchorage. But uh, what was cool about landing there is we were in a DC-3. I'll never forget that. Pretty Spartan setup. And uh, from uh, Iliama, we took a, uh, a two-way caravan, the plane I have now, but on wheels. And we took that to uh, a place called Igiagi. Igiagi is on the western side of uh, Lake Iliama, uh, at the mouth of this uh, river called the Kavijak River. So. Uh, we landed there, gravel runway, and uh, first thing I see in this beautiful clear water, rainbow trout, just hovering. And uh, I'll tell you, everything in Alaska is bigger. The fish are bigger, the moose are bigger, of course the bears are bigger. So uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty cool to see that. And uh, so we took the boat down river a little bit and there on the right was this lodge, two story long cedar kind of lodge. It was September, I believe. Um, and we pulled up and there was a pretty good current going and there was a beat up, I think it was a 185. I wouldn't know at the time. I wasn't even a pilot at the time. Again, this is how I got into it. And, um, we go inside the lodge, and the first thing I see is uh, a wolverine. And by the way, the the uh, lodge owner, his name is uh, his name is Slim. His name was Slim, skinny guy, of course. And what a character he was! Uh, he worked the pipeline, I guess. Smiley knew him, and uh, he had all these kind of stories. Uh, he's definitely a wheeler dealer. Funny, <laughs> it was funny. But yeah, he. I saw this wolverine, I go, wow, and he goes, oh yeah, that saved our, that saved our bacon in here a few times, literally. Um, give you an example, last, uh, last season we boarded the place up, came back in spring, opened up, and the kitchen was ransacked. And the dining room, and then it was like where the wolverine was, uh, the carnage stopped. So apparently a grizzly bear got in there, taken the place apart, got to the living room, saw the wolverine, and hightailed it, I guess. Uh, uh, well, wolverines are little beasts, as we all know. 
So uh, we sit down, we got unpacked all our stuff in, we had it, got, broke open the beers and uh, we we're hanging out in the main living room. And uh, all of a sudden the door flies open and these two, uh, these two guys walk in, these young guys. Um, I swear, they look like, you ever see, you know, that commercial, um, that insurance commercial with the caveman? They looked like that, but worse. They had, their faces were like smashed in, black and blue. Um, it was a real sight. Anyway, what the heck? And they're like, oh yeah, we were in this plane crash last month up river. And, uh, you know, we had a problem and couldn't get in and crashed. You want to go see the plane crash? <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah. So they all, I, I stayed back, they all set off, but I, I heard the thing was really like, how could anyone survive that? Um, I come to find out uh, many years later, I think it was literally like three or four years ago, I was curious about like what really happened. And I looked up the reports and sure enough, online NSTV reports, it's in there, the airplane, they ran out of gas, stalled the plane they didn't even land it like he stalled it and spun in and they like all survived so i mean they were pretty low but still um so we're hanging out there and uh chilling and then it's uh we got our rifles dialed in got the sights you know doing some outside shooting that was cool and the next thing you know we're inside getting ready for appetizers they got uh two guides a guy named Dale, a guy named, I don't know, it was some kid, um, I'll have to tell you about him. Um, and then um, they had the cook and then Slim. Slim was kind of like the master guide that didn't do anything. He just hung out and uh, let everybody do everything for him. Well, he was the owner. Uh, <laughs> that story about him, I mean, his seaplane had so many leaks in the floats. So I guess Smiley had been up there before and he's telling me the story about uh, they were on, he was on this uh, long flight with Slim and uh, they go, uh, they're flying along. You know, they don't have an autopilot, thank God, when you hear this. So Slim, there's just flying along, Slim's in the left seat. Pulls out a pillow from the back, he goes, all right, you're playing. Freaking just lays down, uh, Smiley's a pilot, but you know, he was, he was just a private pilot. He, had, he didn't have a ton of hours. Anyway, he's like, take the plane, I'm going to sleep. And the guy goes to sleep. So we're sitting there in the lodge and uh, we get into the dining room and we're just, you know, like I said, we're getting ready for appetizers. And um, the other group that was there, so I'll tell you a little about the people. So we had the two cooks, we got the two guides. We got another group of guys, I think there was four of them. They were mostly there for fishing. I don't know if they were, we were there for caribou hunting, by the way, and, uh, and some fishing. And they, uh, it was the group from the Weatherby, Weatherby company. I think it was the son of uh, Weatherby's son, the, the younger guy. Again, this is back in the mid nineties. So I don't know if he's running the company at the time, but anyway, the great guys sit down and we got Dale. Uh, Dale is your seasoned, prototypical Alaskan bush guide. Uh, really great guy, new as crap. Uh, and then we have this young kid, and he says, he's more of the fishing guide. And um, they, he was a real smart ass, I gotta tell you. He was like, on the side, out of, out of, uh, out of sight, he was calling the other guests pukes. Um, cause they, one of the guys couldn't find, uh, he couldn't tie a fishing knot or something. So it's like, oh yeah, those guys are pukes. Um, and it just seemed like a real cocky kid. So, uh, but anyway, so we're sitting down there at dinner and, uh, Dale starts telling, you know, we're, we're talking about bear safety and, uh, all the things that you need to do. If a bear comes, a bear comes, you're fishing. The rod is the bears, the fish is the bears, walk backwards, retreat, all that good stuff. And um, one of the guys in the Weatherby group, this, this uh, one of the younger guys, he says, I'll just swat that bear up my 38. And he like pulls this little handgun out and puts it on, kind of slams it on the table. We're like, I, even, even in my inexperience at that point, I was like, that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> but Dale goes, well, just make sure before you shoot the bear that you file that front sight down on that pistol. Just get that sight real smooth. And we're like, what the heck? He goes, so when the bear takes that gun and shoves it up your ass, not going to hurt so much. Perfect. So uh, 
Dale started to tell us some stories that were pretty chilling. Um, there was a story that happened there a couple years before. Um, there, not at that camp, but down the river, um, there was uh, some guests from Minneapolis, I guess. And these guys uh, were bear hunting. They were on Lake Iliyama in a big boat. And um, the guide brought the boat into shore. They were scouting for bear. Saw some bear tracks. And as soon as the, the, sh the ship grounded, the boat grounded, uh, one of the guests just jumped out. And he was so, I guess, stunned by these fresh tracks. And there were so many of them that he kind of lost his marbles. And he just like went in. He started following the trail. He didn't, he was waiting for the other guys. And then he, they said he just went in. He went into the alders. Very low, it's not real high stuff, but pretty thick stuff up there in, in a lot of the areas. That's one thing you don't do. And the next thing they heard was a yell. He came running out. Sure enough, he had, he had busted right into a sow with a couple of cubs. So we all know what happens then. You're always 100% of the time, well, I shouldn't say that, but most of the time you're in for a world of hurt. So she, I guess, came out. It was in front of all of them, got him by the waist, and wham, right paw, took his head practically right off, one swipe. And, uh, and then took off, off her, her cubs. She was kind of smacking his head around like a beach ball a couple of times. That's the way he described it. So that was the setup for our trip. Uh, we were all pretty wired up after that and a few other stories I won't go into. So we spent three days hike, uh, hiking, taking the boat up the Kavijak River, five miles, 10 miles. 15 miles oh caribou so, oh this is really unusual and uh, people were blaming it on El Nino this is the mid 90s I don't know if there was an El Nino then I never heard of what an El Nino was but so we're like uh, let's go farther okay and Dale was totally up for it so we got two boats two guides we got the guy they I call him I'm gonna call him puke um, and, and you'll hear why. You'll understand why. And uh, I was in the boat with uh, Billy and Dale and Puke had uh, Smiley and Bob. And we're just going up river, up river, up river. And uh, I even heard Dale. Dale was like, uh, yeah, I could tell he was getting uncomfortable. And he's like, we're like, come on, come on, a little farther. Now we got to this place. There was, I remember the river. We were probably a third or halfway to King Salmon. If you look at the Kavijak River, it empties out, I think, at King Salmon. Anyway, it goes, it goes out to the ocean. Um, and uh, we get out, the, we get to this bend in the river, and there's, I will never forget, there's this cool, like it was really unique. There were like bluffs. It was like mini mountain, but not big, but for there, I mean, everything was pretty flat and rolling. And uh, oh, it's like, let's go up there. Let's go explore it. Let's, uh, this, this, and Dale's like, yeah, that would be a good place to glass from. So we got up there, we had lunch, we're sitting around. We are glassing, you could just see for miles. You could see for miles and miles. And we did not see a thing. We didn't even see a mouse. We didn't see squat. So um, I'm sitting there and I'm like, but one thing I could see, one thing I was glass, and I thought uh, topographically it was pretty interesting. It looked like about a mile, mile and a half, two miles out. There was something going on. There was like some, something interesting. And I wanted to go explore it, but I wanted to go by myself. So I talked to Dale and he was cool with it. He let me go. So Puke took me across the river. He let me off on the other side. And I'll never forget, it was, um, the bank went up and there was like alders and stuff, but some big openings. And then it kind of went up. And I, I took off, yeah, it was probably 1 p.m. So I start thinking about, uh, Dale was like, only a couple hours and get back. So uh, I got up there and I started hiking. And out there, once you get beyond that, it's just this rolling, these little mounds. And they had some caribou trails here and there. I don't know if they're bear trails or caribou trails. But man, I tried to stay on those as much as I could because it was like hummocks, like ankle twisting, really ridiculous uh, stuff to try and hike through. So I'm hiking along and uh, I probably got a quarter mile and I heard a voice behind me. I'm like, <laughs> what? 
and it's Billy. Billy's like trying to catch me. He's all out of breath. He's like, let me come with, let me come with. I'm like, inside I was like, crap, man. I wanted to do this solo, but uh, all right. So uh, we went on and the first thing, it was funny. Uh, we we're walking along, trudging along and there's all these ponds and lakes and muck and we're just circumventing all this stuff. And all of a sudden we're coming over. And one thing, you do not want to walk with your head down. And you really need to, so you know, you know, you got to watch almost every step. That's why you want to try and stay on these trails because it's a lot of up and down. You could come to the top of the rise. I kept thinking I'm going to come, come to the, every time I came to the top of a rise, I was like, is there going to be a huge grizzly bear? Because this area was like loaded with, you know, they're brown bears, peninsula bears. Probably the only bigger bears are on Kodiak, if if they're any bigger. Um, Fognac is like probably the worst place. Um, Anyway, so I uh, get up, uh, we see a fox go by, and Billy, boom, he, you know, a little, little overkill with his 30-06, shoots the fox. We go, he goes and skins it, puts it in a Ziploc bag, bang, bang, we're on our way. And the cool part was, we finally got to that area that I saw in the, um, uh, that area that I saw from when I was glassing, and sure enough, it were these alders, and some openings and then the, the land dropped down rather dramatically it wasn't a cliff or anything but it was like this it just all went like that it probably went down 20 or 30 feet for up there that was pretty big or that particular area so we're uh uh we're like i swear we're standing there and the what do we see we see three caribou like 300 yards away so we're facing this way it's off to the left down there 300 caribou uh, three 300 three caribou two bulls one small they're all they're all bulls but there were two two good sized bulls one one really good one and uh i'm like so i'm like i'm a i was a bow hunter mostly at the time so i'm like i'm like billy billy and i'm like literally like okay let's go that way and you know i'm thinking how we're gonna stalk get as close as possible and i look up and he's freaking gone he's like running full speed with his with his rifle he pulled his rifle he's running running i'm like boom i take off after him i know what's coming i mean he's just on his own mission so i see him like disappear to the right and i follow and there's an opening i slide down there and there he is he's already on the ground in the prone position bam he shoots the biggest bull slams it knocks it down and as that was happening i was already like chamber of the round I'm standing and I'm dialing in on the next bull and all I can hear is Billy going shoot 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 I'm like shut the fuck up so anyway I dial in on the second bull and he's moving he's kind of bewildered but he's not running and I put a good shot on him and he's just kind of and you can hear the bullet hit it was like I saw uh, you, I saw the, you know, the dust come off the hide. It was, it's all like slow motion. And then you hear the report come back and it sounds like, uh, sounds like it took a two by four and hit a, a carpet that was hanging outside. Bam! It's that, it's, it's really a unique sound. Any hunter will tell you anyway. So, uh, but mine didn't go down. He was kind of stumbling along. So I chambered another one and this turned out to be the bad shot that turned out to be the good shot. Cause it, as it turned out, I found out when, I, when we came up on him, it hit him in the, right in the kneecap, and it just took his leg out, so he went down. So by the time we walked up to these things, they were, uh, they were pretty, uh, pretty much expired, because it turned out my first shot was a heart lung. And uh, so that was good. So we immediately set about caping these things out, getting the meat out, all the usual stuff. Now, I had never done that before, I, and I'm totally on my own. And I don't have the right knives. You know, I've got a, I've got a decent, I've got a buck knife, and um, I think that was all I had. So I'm doing all this with a, you know, I, and I didn't know what I was, you know, I, it was my first time. Um, so, you know, I'm taking my time, and I'm like, oh, I want, the, I want the cape and the horns. I want this chest mount. I'm, I'm already like, so I got some of the meat, and I started working on the head. I was like, you know what, I'm not going to screw this thing up. I got the fur up to the kind of the neck area. I'm like, I'm just going to cut the neck off and just take the whole skull and half the neck out with me, which was crazy, turned out. Um, so there I am. Billy finishes up. He's Mr. Uh, Survival. He's got his, he made a teepee. He couldn't carry all his stuff out, so he made like a teepee. I'll never forget this. 
and he had his, uh, the rest of his meat in there because he got his caped, he had caped it. So a lot of his meat was there and he made like a teepee of twigs and then he put, you know that survival blanket, it's like uh, tin foil. I'll never forget, like he put rocks and he made this like teepee. Anyway, I was, I was like, all right, get back to the river, go back to the river, man. It's getting dark and here in the whole time there's little squalls coming in, it was just crazy. Yeah, I'm like, get back to the river, get back to the river. Um, I was like, I got, we, I got to finish up, just, but go, go. I, I was already thinking of the boat, like, we don't want to miss that boat, like, not that it would leave. But still, you know, we, it was, it was probably late September, I don't know, but it was, I knew it was getting, it, it was getting dark at night. It wasn't like, you know, the, the sunset type of thing, you know, you see in the middle of the summer up there. So, uh, there I am by myself, and I'm just like, <laughs> like, I'm looking around and I'm like, well, I got my, uh, I got my Desert Eagle, I got my rifle, I'm good. And, um, and I'm, I got a boning, it wasn't actually a boning saw, I think it was for cutting brush. Maybe it was a boning saw, I can't remember. But anyway, like I'm like, at the neck bone and I had cut all like the slice and I'm, I'm covered in blood and I'm like in there sawing the neck bone, sweating, I remember sweating. It's just not going through, and it finally getting almost all the way through. It was probably 10 minutes, five minutes, I don't know. It probably seemed like 10 minutes. And um, I'm like, I look at Billy's caribou, and I'm like, oh. I, and I was kind of standing up taking a rest, and he left the Ziploc bag with the fox skin. And I walked over there. And I'm like, well, it's kind of a break time. I'll take a quick break. I'll go get that, get it with my stuff. And I walk over there and I go to pick it up. And I got to tell you, trust your sixth sense. Because I had this feeling something was looking at me. And I was going to pick it up. I didn't bend over and I just kind of went like that. And there was a huge freaking brown bear 30 yards away, right where that bush is over there. And I was just like, this is not happening. I looked at it and I was like, for some reason I was like, is that a real bear? Is that like a fake thing? Like this couldn't be real. That like, and where did it come from? How did I not see it? You would be amazed how these animals, can, you know, when I was in the Arctic once, I was walking, it was flat. I, and I always have this habit, especially in the Arctic is open. I'm like looking behind me every three minutes. And uh, I had an Arctic fox sneak up behind me and almost just about nip me in the calf. It went up against my calf. I was like, what the? So anyway, I'm looking back at this bear and I'm just like, oh shit. So I turned around and faced the bear and uh, he kind of started moving to the left. And what was interesting is after that, he was looking at me, but after he saw me see him and then I started to turn and face him, he moved to the, his, he moved this way. And from then on out, he was just kind of slowly moving laterally. And then he turned, then he came back. He would never look at me. He was always just kind of looking around. I think I knew I, he was after the caribou meat at that point because otherwise, he, I did know enough about bear stuff that, you know, the snapping of the jaws and the, you know, the posture that you get from, uh, the animals if they're going to attack you so uh, but I, I was still I got to tell you I was still scared and for some reason I don't know why I started um, I wa was walking backwards to my um, to my caribou and that's where my rifle was and by the way and I don't know why I did this but I was whistling like I was talking to my uh, my golden retriever like hey boy <whistles> I don't know why I did that but I did that and I would, I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you that's what to do. I'm not even here to tell you that that worked. I wouldn't do anything different because I'm here, but um, that's what I did. And maybe it calmed the bear down or let him know I was aware, I don't know. But um, I was walking back and I remembered, oh, I got my Desert Eagle. You know, I got my Desert Eagle with me. And uh, I didn't know at the time, you don't shoot bears, you don't shoot bears with pistols. Now, Desert Eagle, um, you know, and I don't carry this thing around, but the Desert Eagle is a, is a pretty big gun. 
This is a 50 caliber Desert Eagle, semi-automatic. Um, it, it'll really put a hurt on just about anything you shoot, but you do not want to go shoot bears with any pistol. And I see guys out there in the woods, they've got 45 caliber, I got my Glock, I'll whack that bear. Let me tell you, you're just, you're just, uh, you're just, you're not going to kill the bear. The bear might die a day or two later, but you're going to, you're just going to piss that thing off and you're going to be dead way before that. So thank God. And I didn't really know I had my desert Eagle and, um, it gave me a little more courage, I guess, but, uh, walked back to my caribou. The bear didn't move in and, uh, got my caribou and, uh, got my stuff. And I, I was like, this bear is not getting, this bear is not getting this, this cape. And I took those horns and I just like twisted it. I knew it wasn't much left and I just broke that, that last part of bone and pulled that off. The worst part was I had to pick up my rifle. I had to get um, my backpack, which had all kinds of crap in it and I had some of the meat. And then I had to pick up that caribou head. So with all that stuff, I had to get on my knee and get on the ground, I'm watching the bear and I had to get that thing on my back I was like, how am I going to make it out of here with this? But I, you know, at that point I was more, I was actually more focused on the bear. So I just started walking backwards and I walked backwards all the way up that hill. The bear did not move in. He didn't move much. He moved, he was just kind of moving laterally. Got out of sight and I just, you know, as fast as I could down that rise into the tundra, I hauled my ass back. And uh, it, was, it was getting dark at that point. So I was feeling a lot better. I got my cape, I owe my stuff, but uh, my back, my legs, my le back and legs, you know, after about a mile of that going back started, it really started going. And uh, I remember talking to myself, this is another weird thing. I mean, my, I was in shape. I was doing triathlons, I was in my mid thirties. And, um, you know, I wasn't, you know, the best, the biggest big time athlete, but I was in decent shape and uh, my legs were like ready to give out. I had probably a mile to go and I was, I was screaming at myself, you effing legs, you're not gonna give out, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, get back, I finally made it back. It was the best feeling on the planet. I was like in reach, there it is, right over there. And I get there and there's Billy sitting on the ground with the most dejected look on his face. I'm like, Billy! And he just looks at me. I go, where's the boat? Because I see all this crap sitting there. He goes, he's gone. I'm like, what? Now it's, at this point, it's like just about dark. It's freaking dark. And the emotion, I, can't, I, I have to tell you, the emotion that I had when I went from this high to this like where I just dropped my backpack, I dropped my rifle, and I was just like, fell on my butt. I was just on the ground like, cause my legs were like done. I'm like, all I could think about was, I'm gonna get back, I got this caribou head. We showed them all, we got the caribou, we went out, we, we freaking hiked out there, we made it happen. We didn't hike off the river, uh, hunt off the river, or wait for the herd, we freaking made this happen. And, uh, and I got a bear story to boot. Oh, this is going to be, and I went from there to we're freaking going to have to spend the night out here. So Billy had already tried to start a fire and, uh, you know, old Billy. Now I'm, I'm really prepared these days, but back in those days, I didn't have the survival gear I carry that I, but he, he was pretty good. And even with that, it was rain and everything was soaked. And I remember we built this little twig square all the kindling all that could not get it going and at this point i was like soaked i was like inside and out any of you hunters know you know the feeling uh, after a long hike you do not want to get uh, you don't want to be sweating inside and be soaked because you can't warm up after that and at that point i was really shaken um, I was pretty cold and, uh, you know, I wasn't afraid we were going to die or anything, but it was just like this feeling of, oh man, this is going to be the most miserable night. Um, this is really going to suck. So, um, we sat around together. We just really, we, and he had a lot of his meat with him. He, he brought more out than I did. He, we had two caribou heads and, uh, with that we had, uh, we had bears all around us within probably 30 minutes. 
and we could hear them. We couldn't really see them. Now it was fully dark. It was raining. We had flashlights every once in a while. You could see an, uh, you know, a pair of eyes and then it would move. And let me tell you, those weren't fox or weasels or <laughs> those were bears. So uh, I was like, crap, man, this really sucks. I smell like blood. Here I am. We had our rifles ready, but uh, nothing, nothing moved in, at least at that point, to the point where we heard the uh, drone of an engine. And it was Slim. Slim came back to get us. What had happened was Puke, our friend Puke, was left to stay for us. And Puke came back and told them that I had said, and he lied, that I was, uh, we were going to spend the night out there. That was what he told them. And of course, Smiley about killed him. Smiley's a big guy. He, he goes almost 300 pounds, six foot five, big Norwegian guy. He almost killed him. Slim obviously jumped in the boat. Smiley's like, I'm freaking going too. He's like, no, you can't come in the boat. I got to go alone because the river's so shallow and your weight, we got it. Like, and you don't do the Kavijak at night. All these rivers, you don't, like in the middle of the night, you don't do these rivers because in a lot of places, it's like you got to find these little sweet special spots and channels to get through the waters this deep. They don't even have propellers out. They're using impellers. Anyway, so we heard the drone of this motor coming and uh, it was the best feeling on the planet. And then we started seeing a strobe light. So uh, I started firing my Desert Eagle like that. And um, Slim came and got us. And I'll never forget the feeling when that boat pulled up. And the first thing I grabbed was my caribou head. And I just lugged it over the side. And it was like I saw it in the bow of the boat. Like I got my caribou head. We're back on track. We're going to have our story with the guys. So it was a long, it was a long, uh, it was a long ride back to the lodge. But it was a pretty sweet ride. And uh, got back and... Uh, the, uh, the puke was nowhere to be found. All I don't remember much about that night because it was really late. And all I remember was the next morning I couldn't walk. And Dale was like, hey, we got to go back. Uh, we, gotta, we should go back. I'm like, yeah, I want to get my meat, the rest of my meat. And, but I was like, guys, I can't even walk. My legs had cramped up at that point. I was, I was really, uh, I could hardly get down the stairs of the lodge. So Billy and Bob, I think Bob went, I know Smiley went with Dale, and like, we'll, we'll get you, we got your back. And they went out there, and they went to the same spot. Of course, Billy knew where it was, and they get up to that same little elevation, and Dale was like, he kind of kept them back, and they were crouching down, and so Dale goes up, and he gets up, and he looks over, and there's that, there's that bear. And he said that bear got up on its hind legs and was doing the, you know, the winding, and he, Dale said it was a big bear. And Dale, uh, he got back down, crawled back, got to the guys. He goes, we got to get the fuck out of here, like, right now. And, uh, you know, that place was never to be seen again. So I found out in that afternoon when they all got back um, that that kid was flown out. He, he was just gone. We don't know how, where he went or what, but he was, he was gone. So... Um, that way. So anyway, the, how, do, how did I get into seaplanes? How did that, how did that, well, on that, on that, not on that particular day, but the day before going up the river, this is how I got into it, is and, uh, come in Alaska on the Kavijak River, sun was setting, coming around, and there on the left is a red de Havilland beaver float plane, parked. Pure red, beautiful, like I saw that thing and we're kind of puttering by. And I looked at the guys and go, that's how to get away. That's how to explore. I said, I'm going to do that someday. And they're all like, yeah, sure. They were probably, they were like, yeah, yeah. So I was like, no, I'm going to do this someday. So I literally, when we got back, uh, within a year, I was taking private pilot. I was a pilot. I didn't want to be a pilot at the time. I had no incentive. Uh, so I started taking the... Uh, Private pilot, got my private pilot, you know, Cessna 172. Then I got my instrument rating the next year. And then I got my seaplane rating. And then I saved up and saved up and barely was able to afford, bought my first seaplane because, you know, there's no seaplanes to rent, at least down by us. So uh, that's, that's how I got into it. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, I got to tell you, Alaska is the ultimate frontier. 
Um, I hope to get back there this, uh, the, like I said, I'll take you guys along this spring and uh, plan to get uh, from Anchorage, you know, fly the inside passage from Seattle area, Vancouver up to uh, Ketchikan and then north to Anchorage. I'm definitely gonna hit, I wanna hit Fairbanks and the north, maybe even the Brooks Range. Um, and then I, I might go back to Kodiak, um, check out the Kodiak and Katmai. So, uh, but I, you know, it's uh, the way I do it is you just go and uh, you know, you see what happens and let the wind blow your course. And um, I can't tell you what's gonna happen. It's gonna be an adventure though, so yeah. Good stuff. All right, off to the next mission.